Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. And welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a real treat for you. The case for the locked diff. Yes, you heard it straight from the horse's mouth, ladies and gentlemen. The case for the locked diff. And really, a little bit of backfill about where this tutorial came from. A very dear friend of mine and a mentor of mine asked me to look at a job for a old muscle car and we were talking about it and going oh yeah it's got a lock diff you know it's a bit crude and i said yeah it is really crude isn't it he goes yeah you reckon the lsd would be better yeah definitely so when i started to crunch the numbers this is one of these jobs that you expected to go one way but the job went a, a totally another way and some really good lessons were learned and really i want to share these lessons with you now so to kick things off the lock differential is often thought of as an anachronism. Indeed, one of my VA supercar customers uh, once said to me, you know what, mate? If it's good enough for John Deere, it's good enough for us. And indeed, if you take a look at um, what the lock diff does, it's about as elegant as cracking an egg with a uh, as cracking an egg with a sledgehammer. That being said, and this is one of the real key things I've got learned from this job, for high power applications, it does have its uses. And what I'm going to be doing is presenting this um, with a case study for a high powered stock car slash muscle car. So let's get started. If we take a look at the lock diff, here's your schematic. And here's the problem inherently faced by the lock diff. What happens with the lock diff? Both the outside wheel and the inside wheel are locked at the same velocity. So what happens is that when you are within your traction circle radius limits, what happens is because you get a higher slip ratio on the inside wheel and a lower slip ratio on the outside wheel, that initial turn in right to the mid corner, you get absolutely and utterly horrid understeer. Now, it does have its advantages in the fact that when you start to accelerate, um, it does uh, uh, it, um, it it will have its payoff, which we're going to discuss shortly. But mostly, if we take a look at what the lock diff offers, as I said in my race car engineering article um, about this topic, if you take a look at the approach that the lock diff has, it's a little bit like sending SEAL Team Six into a day case uh, into a daycare center to break up a minor scuffle between a bunch of four-year-olds. So. That being said, the lock diff does have its uses. Despite its drawbacks, there are three key things. Number one, both the left and the right wheels are equal velocity, so you know what they're doing. There's no ifs, ands, or buts uh, to that. Consequently, particularly for ovals, and particularly if you're running on dirt, it makes the whole stagger thing very, very simple. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Also, too, one of the real, uh, real things about the lock diff as the load transfer equals out, the lock diff is going to come to you, and it's a very, very important point. Okay, so what were the parameters for this study? This is some uh, this is some broad brushstrokes of um, the car that was modelled. So the mass was 1,150 kilos. It was a 50% weight distribution. The front and rear track was 1.5 metres. The peak engine horsepower was 440 kilowatts, or about 600 um, horsepower. And the rear suspension type was a live axle. And so what we did was we took the V8 supercar template and bashed and barged it um, to suit. Now, here's where things got interesting. So what we did was we took the existing lock diff model and ran a simulation. And the results of the simulation are shown here. And what I did was looked at turn one at um, Willowbank, which is a very high speed turn. So what we've got here is you've got a mid corner speed of about 155.9 K an hour. But where things get really interesting is these two channels down here where we've got the tractive forces applied at the contact patch and the maximum possible longitudinal forces that are available from the tire. Here's where things got interesting. When we went through and evaluated those ratios where we had high G on the car, here was the nail. The nail was the ideal versus actual distribution was uh, uh, was the same. So that was one of these things that when I initially looked at it, that's when uh, when I almost did a double take to go, ooh, hang on, that's really, really interesting. Because if we take a look at particularly the mid-corner conditions at the 683 and 700 meter mark, you can see in this table that in terms of these are your ideal forces, that's the maximum possible force you can get from the tire. And this was the force applied at the contact patch. Take a look, that was like 91% versus 84%. 
and 84% and uh, 84% versus 80. And I just take took one look at that and I went, ooh, isn't that ever so very even isn't that both very interesting and ever so revealing? And that for me was the thing that it was almost like you almost like the had the ideal super diff option in there. And I just went, I just took a look back and I go, ooh, okay. So so what I then did was um, I figured to myself, well, hang on, a bit of tuning on the LSD. I should uh, on the limited slip diff option. And I should be able to um, uh, dial this in very closely and a little bit of backfill here. In terms of the limited slip diff options in chassis sim, uh, they've been tested on cars as diverse as GT3 cars, as open wheelers, sports cars and um, and uh, uh, cars such as um, uh, Time Attack with all-wheel drive. And the correlation, the trends have always been spot on. So it was one of these studies where I thought to myself, okay, we're gonna be in a really good situation to make some good broad brush strokes to go the right direction. But here's the thing, no matter what we did with the limited slip diff, it never quite matched out to being as good as the lock diff for this car and in particular so i just figured okay well what we'll do is we'll start off with a very very gentle locking ratio on the locks uh, on the limited slip diff so a 10 percent locking ratio on power and five percent coast you know as you can see from the lap time here which in the simulated um track was uh willow bank uh, uh, was uh, willow bank otherwise known as queensland raceway in queensland australia what you could see is that we started off at a 105 for uh, the lock diff and so uh, uh, so when i ran the initial uh, uh, when i ran a very very conservative diff setup i just figured okay 106.7 and what i did was i kept locking the diff up i kept locking the diff up by upping the locking uh, uh, by upping the locking ratio and the, tr and the lap times were dropping down but they were still quite a ways um from the lock diff option so literally as a um uh, so literally as sort of um a die for the deck what i did was i locked up the diff under braking and I tried 40% power, 60% coast. And you can see here with this limited slip diff option, you were basically getting, in terms of raw lap time, sure, it was about 0.28 shy of the lock diff option. And that was one of these things where I just stood back and went, wow, because what's really interesting, when you're talking about a locking ratio of 60% under power and a lock coast, you might as well be talking a very, very, but you might as well be talking a very rough approximation of the lock diff. So that was just one of these things that went, oh, isn't that uh, isn't that ever so um, interesting? And that was one of these things where I was expecting the job to go one way, and this job went a totally different way. But sometimes vehicle dynamics does that to you. You you, you get a situation where you expect it to go one way, but it goes another. And that I thought to myself was ever so revealing. And here's why it didn't get close. If we take a look, this was a uh, um, uh, colored um, was the uh, was the lock diff. Black was the LSD. The throttle traces and the uh, 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 the tractive forces and throttle traces uh, tell a very very compelling story. Take a look at the at the black throttle trace here, which is the LSD. It's just not getting the power down. If we take a look at the tractive forces down here, you can see here that the black is the LSD. The colored is the lock diff it's just not getting particularly under traction it's not getting um uh, uh, it's simply not getting the power out the other thing too and we'll touch upon this very briefly too take a look at the steered angle here under turn uh, under turning it's less so sure we've got a little bit less uh, we've got a tad less understeer but i think that's actually been uh, driven by the lower cornering speed as well so what I think is re and that was uh, and just to uh, be clear that was the um, diff that was if my memory serves me correctly it was just going back here it was 10% coast 40% power so what I thought was ever so interesting so this shows you that um, uh, the setup here had been optimized around the lock diff which brings me to the discussions of the limitations of the study the suspension setup itself was the live axle the base model itself was geared for turning it was totally geared to make up for the ills of the live um, axle so that being said though i thought that the limited slip diff would offer enough of an advantage that it would actually cancel that out i was wrong and also too given the inherent understeer um, the lock diff ha has what this does is it gave the lock diff a clear advantage, which really shows you the effect the differential has on your vehicle setup. So again, another very interesting data point. 
However, there is a dark side to the lock differential. And this dark side very much emerged when um, the chassis driver and um, uh, when chassis driver and the loop was being developed. When you're below the traction circle um, radius limits, the lock diff will give you bucket loads of understeer. However, once you break traction, the lock diff really does exhibit the doctor uh, does accept, it does exhibit doctor uh, the Mr. Ho uh, the Dr. Jell and uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde characteristics. And here's why. If we take a look, this was some initial testing we did with um, driver in the loop. And the problem was that it, you were having understeer, understeer, understeer. You'd hit the throttle, and all of a sudden the axle would be driving you. It was actually giving some quite unstable behavior. Now, ultimately, we got that sorted. Um, and because I know my competitors are going to be tuning into this, I'm not going to tell you how. That being said, it did raise a very raise a point that because in a lock diff, the wheel velocities are the same. When you break traction on both of those, what will happen is that the inside tire force drops to nothing and the outside tire force, you're still not at the peak slip ratio. So all of a sudden you get a very, very big oversteering moment. It's almost as if when you break traction, uh, break tra uh, before you break traction, the lock diff is turning, trying to turn you out of the corner. You break traction, the lock diff is trying to turn you around quite violently. This, ladies and gentlemen, is very much the dark side of the lock diff. And so before all of you go out and um, take a TIG welder and start welding your diffs together, you've got to be well aware of that. Some conclusion and parting thoughts. For high powered applications, the lock differential definitely points to some rather interesting character, uh, uh, some rather interesting characteristics and indeed some desirable pro uh, properties. Fair enough, the scope of this study was limited to a live axle car with the actual car model itself being optimized to turn into cure the um, uh, uh, to um, uh, to cure the turn in the inherent understeer of a lock diff. That being said, if I was to repeat this study on an independent rear end car, I would fully expect to see um, different different results. That being said, particularly when we look back at how those ideal force distributions um, at the close matchup of the ideal um, uh, force distributions here, that's one of these things where you just go, well, hang on, the lock diff may not be the uh, the lock diff may not be the ultimate magic bullet. But there's something in there that's very, very interesting to study, particularly when you're trying to tune in a limited um, uh, slip diff. That uh, so look um, to wrap uh, to wrap this up. What I'm uh, 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 this is good food for thought. Now, for those of you who have already got LSDs, this is not the point where you go out and start TIG welding your LSDs. That being said, there's some really good thoughts for here about. The fact that the lock diff can actually bring something to um, uh, 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 to the table. The nice thing about vehicle dynamics, and particularly race car vehicle dynamics, you'll always get some jobs that surprise you from time to time. That being said, um, the next step now is have a think about this. For those of you who are existing who are existing chassis users, throw some on the wall, have some fun. And for those of you who are not um, existing chassis users. Um, Try our online simulation. Have a play with the V8 supercar template. See what you can find. In particular, change around um, uh, the um, the, bar, uh, the bar balance and, uh, and see what happens. And we'll catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics.